Welcome to the Quilt Addicts Anonymous beginner quilting video tutorial series. Today we're talking about quilting. We're going to show you how to do straight and wavy line quilting using your walking foot on your home sewing machine so you can finish this quilt yourself and do it all from start to finish. QT Fabrics proudly sponsors this video tutorial series by Quilt Addicts Anonymous. Make sure you go check out their website at qtfabrics.com and join in the fabric fun they imagine so you can create. All right, so we're going to be using walking foot quilting. So the first thing we have to do is actually put our walking foot on our sewing machine. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So up until now, we've been using our regular presser foot, either your quarter inch presser foot or the standard one that comes on your sewing machine. But we need to take that off. So a walking foot usually is hidden in the compartment with your sewing machines. It is has a little contraption on it, this claw, and what it does is it sits on, it kind of goes this way, and it's going to sit on this part of your sewing machine that is called a shank. This is a shank that your um, sewing machine feet connect to, and then the claw goes over this part. Um, some of them have a claw like this, and some of them just have a bar that will sit on top of this piece, but either way, you either need the claw going around this part here or sitting on top of it because that's what makes it move up and down. So a walking foot, the reason why you use it when you quilt and when you put on binding is you have feed dogs on the bottom of your machine and that's what feeds the fabric through evenly when you're piecing. Well, when you start quilting, you have a lot of layers to go through. So you wanna use a walking foot because it also has these feed dogs on the bot or on the top that help move all the layers through at an even pace. So if you don't use these, you're gonna end up with drag and parts of your quilt will be quilted at different rates than another, and it just won't be even. So this is really important to have. If your machine did not come with one, you can usually get them. You just need to know if your machine has a low shank, which is this part that, the feet attached to or a high shank. Most home sewing machines have a low shank. So I'm gonna show you how to put this on first. So first I'm going to remove my foot and keep in mind that each sewing machine is gonna be a little bit different so you may want to consult your manual to see how that works. So I always make sure I store it away in the compartment that my sewing machine has built in so I don't lose anything. We don't wanna do that. So now I'm gonna take my Um, screwdriver that comes with it and I'm removing this part. This is a part that attaches to all the flat feet on my machine and again each sewing machine may be a little different but we need to have that part off because there is a little attachment that is going to fit over this part on there. So I'm going to unscrew it a little bit more and pushing it in at the same rate I've got the claw on the part that goes up and down when your sewing needle goes up and down. And then I have this second part on my left that is wrapping around the shank where the other piece was that we just unscrewed. So now holding that steady, I'm gonna tighten this. If you're having trouble where your walking foot is kind of flopping around on you, probably you didn't tighten this properly. So you wanna make sure it is good and snug before you get started. So that's it, I put my walking foot on my machine. Now you know what this weird looking thing is that came with your sewing machine and you'll be able to use it. All right, so I'm gonna put my sewing machine so that the needle is in the center position. That way I can kind of look straight down the center and I'm good to go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about thread selection before we get started. I have my box of Aurofil thread in my collection. So if you remember in the first episode of this series, I showed you that I normally use white or light gray when I'm piecing everything. That's because most of the time you're never gonna see that when you have your finished quilt. But you are definitely going to see it when you go to quilt. So we wanna make sure that we're choosing a color that works well and plays nice across the quilt. So for that, I'm going to consider pink a light teal and a dark teal. Now I have black too and I'm gonna use that in the bobbin but I don't wanna use it on top because it's gonna be really stark and really show off um, in all the places that are not black and especially when you're getting started you really don't wanna do that. You want your quilting to enhance and add texture. You don't want it to be like 
oh my God, she quilted everything with black thread. And I can really see that over all the cute little pink butterflies. That would be a little distracting. So I've got my big roll that we made in the last video and I'm gonna unroll the side on the left because that I'm just gonna let hang as I'm sewing and quilting here. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna kind of lay this thread across and kind of see what it looks like. And it may be kind of hard to see on camera because it's really light. And I, right away I'm thinking that this dark teal is not gonna work. Because the dark teal, this is more like blue than teal, so this just is not really working. So I'm already, I'm gonna take this teal and I'm gonna put it away. I don't think we need to use this one. Now the light teal, it still doesn't match that blue exactly but it kind of blends. So when in doubt, lighter will always kind of disappear more than another, but I think the clear winner here is the pink because the pink is pretty much the same color as the pink that's in here, which means it's going to blend really nicely when we are seeing pink. When I'm sewing over this black, it's just gonna look like another one of the hash marks, which is really nice. And I really am just liking the way that it looks. Um, and it also isn't too distracting when it is on the white parts. So that'll be good. It'll just look like texture from a distance. Obviously you'll see pink on white when you get up close and look at it, but it's gonna look pretty good from a distance. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these away. And I'm going to re-thread my sewing machine with the pink. Just a quick note, if you're ever having any tension problems with your machine, just re-thread the entire top and bobbin. Cause that will fix your problems like 99% of the time. Now for your back, you have two options. You could use the exact same thread as you're using in your top thread. That can be really nice if you're a beginner because ideally those two threads are gonna loop around each other inside your quilt and the batting, um, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you see what's called little pokies where you would see like a little bit of pink going through to the bottom and a little bit of black coming through to the top. Um, but I really like sort of the black look. It, this reads really dark to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and wind a bobbin with black thread. Um, if you have extra bobbins, wind up a couple of them because you're gonna be do, going through a lot of them at this step and then you don't have to stop every single time you run out. One more note about thread tension. If you really are, if you do two threads like I do or you're really seeing um, a lot of threads coming up to the top or the bottom, then you'll wanna pay attention to your dial, your thread tension dial. If you're seeing the threads come to the bottom, so you're seeing where the, the bottom thread is basically laying across your quilt back instead of meeting neatly in the center the way it should, then you want to increase the tension. If it's the opposite and the thread is basically laying on top, and the bobbin thread is coming all the way up to the top, then you need to lower your tension. So basically it's opposite of wherever the fabric is not where it should be. Okay, so one other thing that I've done here is I have a really long tail of both my bobbin and my top thread. So I'll show you what that means and why in just a second. And then I use my machiner's quilting gloves for this step. They have little grippies on the fingertips that make it really nice to grab that fabric with. I do not do binding or machine quilting on my home sewing machine without these. They're really lightweight, so it's getting to be the summertime here when I'm filming this. I've got the air off right now because otherwise you would hear it in the background, and I'm gonna be fine using these. I'm not gonna get overheated or anything like that. So what it does is just really helps you grip and you can move everything really easily without having a lot of effort on your wrist strain, and it just is a lot easier to push everything through. So I made some test sandwiches to show you straight line and wavy quilting. I'm gonna move my sewing needle to the center of the machine. I'm gonna line the edge of my walking foot up with the edge of my little test sandwich here. When you're doing this on an actual quilt, you can line it up with a seam line to sort of give you a guide. So I'm just keeping that edge even and sewing straight. Now for my next line, I'm gonna go ahead and line up the edge of the presser foot with the line that I just sewed to sew another straight line.
you wouldn't have to stitch this close together. I'm just doing it because it's a nice, easy guide and visual to go by. But you could always use piecing as your guide. You could just line the edge of your press foot up with the seam line and quilt that far away from it. You could mark your lines and quilt every one inch. There's lots of ways that you can do this and keep it straight. Now I'm gonna show you some wavy lines. It kind of starts out the same way, except I'm gonna rock the piece back and forth a little bit. My goal here is to just have smooth curves. as I go down. Now on this next one, I'm gonna go over a little bit further. And I'm not trying to replicate the same wave because that's impossible. Um, I'm not a machine. And so I'm just gonna make waves and they're gonna be any which way they actually are and it's all fine. I'll do one more so you can kind of see the texture this creates. So this is my little quilted sample. We've got some nice little straight lines on the edges and some wavy lines down the center. You can kind of see that it just creates a little bit different texture. Um, the straight line obviously is nice and straight and the wavy has more of a wavy texture to it. So when you wash this later, it's gonna kind of crinkle up and the batting usually shrinks just the teeniest little bit. And so you'll see that texture more uh, clearly. I'm gonna flip it over and show you the back because I've got the black thread on it. I think you're gonna be able to see it a little clearer. Um, you can see real easily there that I've got my nice straight lines and then I have my wavy lines. With wavy lines, you kinda wanna keep them evenly spaced apart, but you don't need to like measure this. Obviously it's a lot closer here than it is here, but it still looks cute and fun and it'll create a nice texture. So we're gonna make that little mug rug out of this guy and now we're gonna actually work on our quilts. Okay, so I'm gonna do wavy line quilting on this quilt and I'm going to start by kind of going where my blocks are in half and the halfway point. So here is where the two blocks come together. I'm gonna to do a wavy line across that and then wavy line down the center of the block. And what that is going to do is it's going to secure my quilt and then I can take all my pins out and then I can add more texture and quilting later. Do make sure you take a look at the batting that you use to see how densely it recommended you quilt it. You may have to quilt as close as three inches apart depending on what your batting requirements are. So you need to follow whatever your batting requirements are when you're deciding how densely to quilt your machine. All right, so this is gonna get heavy. So what you wanna do is I have this rolled up to the center here and I'm making sure that I am sliding everything underneath like I'm I don't have my backing isn't caught or flipped under or anything all right so I'm gonna start a few inches off the top and I'm gonna go ahead and bring my needle down and up again and then pull it back towards me and give that top thread a tug and what that does is it pulls your bobbin thread up to the top and that will keep your thread from getting in a mess and a nest underneath and it's a good practice to get into because if you were to your thread were to break or you were to run out of bobbin in the middle of the row this is how you will start and stop your stitches for your next one so i'm bringing my needle back down right where that bobbin thread came up that will make it invisible and the stitch forward to and back to, and that locks my threads in place. I would be able to clip them after that. Um, if you're doing a show quilt, there's more fancier things that you can do. You can watch my video on how to hide threads. Um, but for the majority of quilting applications, the blocking your stitches by going forward and back is perfectly fine. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stitch straight until I'm on the quilt. Okay, so now I'm on the quilt. I've got my hands. Um, on either side here. And I'm just going to gently kind of go back and forth. The idea here is not to end up with a big like jerky movement, but just to calmly go back and forth. And the reason why I'm recommending the wavy line, although they certainly could do straight, is when I teach this in person, 
A lot of times people get hung up on their lines not being straight and they spend a lot more time ripping than quilting. But if you just start off with it not being straight and your intention is to be wavy, then that's a design choice and you're fine. And if you do end up with like a jerky motion, like your curves aren't as curvy as it could be, they look more like um, points, it's okay. It's your first quilt. And the point is, is that by the end, they're looking good, even if your first ones don't look as awesome as they could be. All right, so you can see I'm stopping with my needle down. I'm kind of readjusting the quilt a little bit as I go. And I'm really only quilting about four or five inches at a time here. Whenever my hands have reached as far as they'll go, like the heels of my palms are at the edge of my sewing machine throat, that's when I kind of readjust. I move things forward, get some more uh, fabric over there, and then do a little bit more sewing. But you're not gonna do yourself any favor if you are so concerned about your quilting being perfect right off the bat that you're ripping everything out because it's not gonna be perfect right off the bat. And that's okay. The point is, is that you show improvement. You also can increase your stitch length a little bit on here. I'm gonna increase mine to about 3.5. It'll help it go a little bit faster because your stitches will be a little bit longer. And this is a really small throat plate. I deliberately did this entire class on this basic model sewing machine. This is a really, it's the Rachel by Baby Lock. Um, it's one of their beginner, it's marketed as like a beginner machine. So you don't need the huge fancy one. I have a huge fancy one, but for this one, I wanted to show you guys that you do not need that to quilt at home. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and secure my stitches by sewing two back and two forward. You technically could skip this step because we're already off of the quilt um, and this part's gonna get cut off when we do our binding, but it's a good practice to get into and then you'll know what to do when, if you need to change thread in the middle of a machine. So I'm really happy with how this thread is looking. It really is just kind of disappearing in there. It's just giving a little bit of texture. You really can barely see it um, in the dark parts and then it just kind of gives a little bit of pop um, when it heads over the blues and the pinks and the whites. So now I'm gonna go ahead and keep sewing down those seams in between our blocks and then at the halfway point and that will secure it. What I'm gonna do next is I am going to unroll one roll coming towards me and then I'm gonna do the middle of that block seam. And I'm gonna keep doing that until I get all the way to the end, and then we're gonna flip it around and go the other way. Okay, so I am now at the very edge of the right side of my quilt. And what I'm gonna do is even though I don't have a seam to sew over, I'm gonna sew like just on the inside of this to secure that down because then I can pull my pins out and I won't have to worry about this flopping around as I'm working on my quilt. And as you do this, obviously you don't have anything to hang on to on the side that's quilty, but I just kind of make sure that everything is nice and smooth out this way so that way this part doesn't get bunched because that's your goal. Keep everything nice and flat. 
All right, so I've now quilted the entire right side of my quilt along the lines where the blocks go together and then the center points of the block. Now I'm gonna do the same thing working from the center out on the left side. So to do that, I need to flip everything around, re-roll it and do it all over again. So now I'm rolling everything, this time working on the side that has not been quilted, that we've laid out nice and flat before. And again, I'm just trying to keep that as tight as possible so that it fits nicely underneath our sewing machine throat. All right, I found my center seam. It is right here. This one's already quilted, so this is going to be the seam that I quilt next. And we're gonna start working from the inside out again. The reason why you always wanna start from the center is sometimes, depending on how densely you quilt, the batting can kind of shrink up a little bit and the backing as well. We kind of talked about that a little bit in the last video, but you work from the center out so that way that ease kind of eases out as you're working on it. Otherwise, you might have like a big clump of stuff to ease in in the center and that would be really bad and not good. So I'm gonna repeat this time going to do the other side of my quilt. All right, so I have quilted down the block seam joins and then the middle of every single one and you're not done yet. You have just secured your quilt. You definitely need to do a lot more quilting even if you're quilting um, eight inches apart, but I've been going for about an hour. Um, obviously it's not that long in the video, but now is the time when I would recommend you take a break because this can be kind of hard on the body. You're kind of hunched over doing this with your shoulders. So try to relax, put those shoulders back. Sometimes I'll wear like a racer back sports bra because it forces me to have good posture, but you really only want to do this for about an hour at a time. Um, because then one, your body doesn't get a sore or fatigued and two, um, you are come back to it a little fresher, so your quilting is gonna be a little bit better. So just do an hour at a time. Um, but what I'm gonna do, because I'm filming this for you guys, so I'm gonna take one for the team. I'm gonna pull out all of my safety pins at this point because we've secured it. We no longer need those to base our quilt together. And then I'm gonna start quilting down the centers of those blocks and I'll show you kind of where I'm kind of eyeballing to do that. Okay, so I pulled all my pins out, so now I'm free to stitch wherever I want. I've already stitched down the seam lines, both of where the block is sewn together and then the halfway point. So in the split nine patch, there's two more great points that are midway through that block. And that's going to be where you can see you've got the little square and then the little square here. So I'm kind of aiming for these mid block seams and I'm just going to quilt back and forth over these. And I'm gonna do it in each block as I go. I'm not gonna do like all of these and then unroll and do all of those because that's not really efficient. So I'm gonna sew all the way down the midpoint here and then all the way down the midpoint here. Obviously, you're not always gonna be able to see that seam. So like when I'm in this section here or this section here, there's no seam to kind of guide me. So you kind of do have to eyeball it, but that's where that wavy line is really nice because it's supposed to be wavy. So if you get off a little bit, no big deal. Just kind of get back on track when you get to another seam to kind of guide you and anchor you at that point. So let's get started. Just like last time, I'm starting in the center. That's because then we don't have too much bulk to get underneath this throat plate. And I'm gonna put half of the quilt, just lay it out as much as I can on the desk. And that will kind of help keep the weight of the quilt under control. Same deal, we wanna pull our bobbin thread up and get that out of the way so we don't have a thread nest underneath. Stitch two forward, stitch two back, everything nice and lined up, and start sewing. Okay. 
All right, so I've reached my first point where I don't really have a seam to guide me. So I can see, if I'm looking straight forward, I can see where this next seam is. So I just kind of want to flatten this out and kind of use that as my guide. Obviously, I don't want to get too close to where this fold is because as long as I kind of stay center, then I'm going to end up about where the seam is when I come back to it. And I did a pretty good job. So you just kind of eyeball it. And again, I'm doing wavy lines, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And even if you're doing straight lines and it's not perfect, that's okay too. If you wanted a perfect quilt, you would buy a bed in a bag that was made by a machine somewhere overseas. So this is handmade, not supposed to be perfect. So give yourself permission not to be. So now for this next part, I don't have a seam to start with to kind of eyeball it. So I'm kind of just kind of eyeballing. I can see my seam down here and I've kind of got that in line with my belly button. And so my needle is also in line with that. So if I kind of back it up just a little bit, then I'm gonna be close enough. And again, we're doing that wavy line so it doesn't have to be right on. You kind of just want it to look even from a distance when you are all done with everything. All right, so I've got that one block done. I'm gonna keep on going until I've got my entire quilt quilted on the right. And then again, we're gonna turn it around and do it on the left. That's it, two hours and two bobbins later, I have quilted all through my quilt. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Um, if you have gotten through this part, you can be done at this point, or we can talk about some options that you can do to make it denser or add more texture to it. All right, so to recap, the first thing I did was I quilted at each seam line where the block was and then also halfway through that block and that stabilized it enough to where I could take out my pins. Then I went through and I followed the lines where these split nine patches come together and I quilted just a wavy line through each of those. Now at this point, I could call it done. My quilt batting that I use, I can quilt up to eight inches apart. So this is definitely quilted enough to secure it and keep that batting from separating over time and use. So I could be done with it at this point. Now, whether you're done with it is totally up to you and your personal preference. You could continue to quilt down the center of each of these. And if you want even more texture, you could then quilt down the centers of the lines that's created there. You could go and repeat this process going in the opposite direction. So you can quilt all the way down your centers or your seam lines again, and then you can hit going down the block again and create a nice little grid. I think I'm actually gonna do that uh, off camera later, but if you want it to be done now, you absolutely could be, and that's totally fine. Now, if you have a batting where you're supposed to quilt every three inches, you might wanna either consider doing another grid going down, going in the opposite direction, or do another line down the center, and that'll really secure it really well for the use and, and abuse that it's gonna take because we want our quilts to be used. We didn't just make them to look pretty, we want them to be used, which means they need to be quilted sufficiently so that they will wash well. But if you wanna be done at this point, you can be, as long as you've used batting where you can quilt um, more than three inches apart. So I hope you really have enjoyed this process. We're not done yet. I'm gonna show you how to do the binding, which is a part that goes around the edge of your quilt to secure this uh, raw edges and hide that. Um, let's just take a quick peek at the back too. I, that black thread was really a very good choice. You really don't see it very much at all. You do wanna kind of take a check and make sure there's no lumps or bumps back here. You didn't get any pleats in as you were sewing. If you end up sewing, doing a grid going the other direction, just you know, make sure you're using your hands to really kind of pull that apart as you're going across your seam lines and that will help keep from getting pleats on this side. But I really hope you're enjoying this. So far, we just have to bind the quilt and then 
our final video is going to be about making a label for your quilt so that everyone knows that you made it and what the occasion was for and how to wash and care for your quilt over time. Thanks so much for following along with me. I hope you're really enjoying making your first quilt. We are almost there. So stick with us and we'll show you how to finish this up. Happy quilting. QT Fabrics proudly sponsors this video tutorial series by Quilt Addicts Anonymous. Make sure you go check out their website at qtfabrics.com and join in the fabric fun they imagine so you can create.